Thank you so much, Chris. And hello, everyone. I'm Wendy Williamson, your district director. And I want to welcome you to this very special event. Thank you for joining us for this first ever pre-district conference kickoff meeting for our first ever virtual district conference, which will be held April 16th to the 18th. Now, you have my personal guarantee this meeting will banish any Zoom felt before. I want to remind everybody that education and training is the cornerstone of the Toastmasters program. We're in our sites this year, we have stepped up to meet our members' goals them improve communication and leadership skills. Now, the program quality team alone this year has provided our members with over 50 workshops and panel discussions and a huge array of guest presentations. I want to thank you all for your participation in all these events and your engagement. But today is truly the feather in this cap with our esteemed guest, Patricia Fripp, joining us. So I ask if you sit back, enjoy the gifts that Patricia is going to share with you and absorb all that you can. And now I would like to turn the meeting over to our program quality director, DTM. Chris Nelson. Thank you, Wendy Williamson, DTM District Director. This is what you can look forward to. In advance, we asked you to submit the questions you wanted our keynote speaker to answer. We selected and summarized the most popular. Distinguished Toastmaster Anita Pathak, my program quality director, partner, and friend, is going to be our moderator. And on your behalf, she'll pose as many of your questions as we have time for. As you know, our keynote speaker for our district conference in April is Patricia Fripp. Companies hire Patricia Fripp to help them drive more business by perfecting their sales conversations and presentation. She's a Hall of Fame keynote speaker, executive speech coach, coach and sales presentation skills expert. Her online program, FrippVT.com, Powerful Persuasive Presentations, is embraced as a must-have by speakers and companies worldwide. Meetings and Convention Magazine named her one of the 10 most electrifying speakers in North America. Kiplinger's Personal Finance wrote that learning presentation skills from Patricia Fripp is one of the best ways to invest in your career. In 2019, she was named one of the top 30 women in sales and one of the top 30 global gurus. Patricia was the first woman president of the National Speakers Association. She was the second woman ever to keynote an international Toastmasters convention. Her last main stage at our international convention was 2015 in Las Vegas. You have to admit, that's not bad for a young woman who arrived in San Francisco at age 20 with no job or contacts and $500. Anita, over to you. Thank you very much, Chris. All right, everyone, let's fasten our seat belts and enjoy this exciting ride. Patricia, the submitted questions by our audience follow two key themes. Number one, how to build a speaking career. And number two, how to improve our communication skills. Patricia, after that wonderful buildup, everyone wants to know how your impressive career began. Please take us back to the beginning of your story. Thank you. Well, understand that I've had a very long <laughs> and inventful life. But the snapshot is I was born in England in a small town at a time when nobody really expect much of women. And at 12, I realized I'm probably more artistic than academic. So I'm going to be a hairstylist. And I started my 
apprenticeship to be a ladies hairstylist at 15. At 20, I emigrated to America. And I'm frequently asked, why did you do that? And all I can say is, it seemed like a good idea at the time. So if you think, I have had two careers, behind a hairstyling chair and as a presenter. And this that you're looking at, in when I was 23, I was one of the first women in men's hairstyling when it was a brand new industry. And that's when I started really traveling and speaking for a hair product company. And I would deliver seminars on not only how to cut hair, but at that point, I was the star of my Dale Carnegie class and my mentor who had sent me to Dale Carnegie said, well, now, that you've gone through all the Dale Carnegie classes, you have to join Toastmasters to continuing practicing. Now, at, at, I, at the time I was opening my own business, I joined Cable Car Toastmasters. And lucky for me, the club met in the IBM building in San Francisco downtown. And IBM always, certainly at that time, the people who got promoted more were those who were good speakers. And we were lucky because we had a lot of IBMers and you know the quality of a club very often depends on the members who are more seasoned and the quality of the feedback. And because I was cutting hair, and a lot of my clients said, you know, you have, we always talk to our hairstylists. Well, Patricia, you're talking to, to hairstylists about how to get, keep and deserve customers. Why don't you come talk to my Rotary Club and Kiwanis Club and Lions Club? And from the first couple of talks, I realized people who heard me speak came into my salon. I realized that this was the best way I could promote my business. Now, a question that most people ask, oh, as I did at the time, is, oh, well, I love to speak, but what can I talk about? I'm not an expert at anything. However, I did realize I was an expert and what I was teaching hairstylists on how they could get, keep and deserve customers, how they could promote a small or medium sized business, which is what I was doing, can be adapted to all industries and associations. I also, as a not knowing I would ever be a professional speaker, However, I was really interested in speaking and I found that speaking to service clubs, of course, maximized my potential. Now, this is how I did it. At Rotary Clubs, there are always visiting members who have to make up for missing at their club. So I'd, I would not only wander around and introduce myself to everybody. But especially if they were visiting, I would give them a card and say, if you like my speech, please recommend me to your program chair. The advantage of now is every club and group and organization, who, they are now having their meetings in Zoom. I belong to a club called the Continental Breakfast Club. And we have speakers from not only all over the country, but friends of mine in England who speak at our meetings. So we can expand our area. So you have to have a good speech. Well, my best friends were my friends in the Dale Carney class. We were all very ambitious and we went to every seminar and every rally we heard about. And a professional speaker came to hear me speak, a man called Chris Hegarty, that I had watched on a big rally and he, he was local. And he gave me very good advice. He said, Patricia, if you really think you might wanna do something with your speaking, you must go 
to the National Speakers Association Convention. Well, at all the rallies I'd been to, I'd heard about it, I had joined. So I turned up at my first NSA convention thinking no one's going to want to talk to me. I only talk to Rotary clubs and hairdressers. Now, in those days, the National Speakers Association convention didn't look like that. My first convention, there were 175 people and two situations appeared. Apart from the fact I found everyone very welcoming and they were interested in talking to me. At luncheon, I sat next to a gentleman who said, you know, I'm in charge of a program where new speakers get the opportunity to stand up and deliver 10 minutes of their material. Would you like to be on the program? I said, yes. And afterwards, a big time promoter came up to me and said, Patricia, you're the best woman speaker I've ever heard. You have a card. I said, no. A month later, he booked me to speak to 2,000 people on the same program with Dr. Robert Schuler, who was one of the most popular speakers at the time. He was from the Crystal Cathedral. Secondly, I saw the vision of what was possible. And now, I began, as you heard, my hairstyling career at 15. When I joined Toastmasters at 30, I signed a 10-year lease on my own salon and I loved the hairstyling business because not only was I good at it and I was a natural promoter and speaking was part of this, it was such an education because the most affluent and all the up and coming stockbrokers, all the wheelers and dealers in the financial district were sitting in my chair. And once I found by speaking at service clubs, etc., that that was bringing more business in, not for me, but for my staff, I trained all my hairstylists to tell their customers, you know, Patricia's doing quite a lot of speaking on teamwork and, and customer service. If you get 20 of your employees together, Patricia will come give a free talk for you. So what you do at the very beginning of your career, you take the people who know and love you. In other words, they know you, they have a relationship with you and you ask them for help. And that was how I started speaking. And the first five weeks when I went full time in 1984, the first five weeks work was in Morristown, New Jersey for AT&T that came as a direct first invitation from one of my hairstyling clients, Gary Hickox, who said to his boss, oh, I can get a speaker for our next staff meeting. It was his hairstylist. Many of my original working for Fortune 100 and Fortune 500 companies and household name companies came from my hairstyling clients. So if you, once you have a talk, you have to have something to say that is universal, tell everybody you know, I am willing to speak. So, of course, the National Speakers Association has become a very important part of my life because whereas Toastmasters builds us confidence and teaches us speaking, you really need to understand the business if you want to put your shingle up as a, hair, as a professional speaker. And in 1984, I became the first woman president. But it might interest you to know, in the year... 2000, 60 minutes came to the National Speakers Association convention. They filmed everything for five days. And I, of course, like everybody, I was, I was standing in line because I wanted to be interviewed for 60 minutes. And I realized that if I'm going to go on 60 minutes, I need to speak in a soundbite, what we would now call a tweetable length quote long before we invented Twitter. And it might interest you to know, 
to see what I said. This former hairdresser, like others in the trade, is a born talker. When I was a hairstylist, I worked on the outside of people's heads. Now, as a motivational speaker, I work on the insides of their heads. There's only half an inch difference. And that, that line got me on 60 Minutes. That half inch has made me millions of dollars. Not all in the same year, of course. So that is pretty much how I went from a hairstylist to a speaker to launch a speaking career. And then the next level is I was smart enough to know in my heyday of when I was delivering 120 keynotes a year that what is getting me booked now is not not necessarily how I'm going to get paid another 10 and 20 years. And this is where you look for opportunities because I'm a great believer opportunity does not knock once. It knocks all the time. We don't always recognize the sound. So if you think going to Dale Carnegie, going to Toastmasters, telling my customers and clients that I was speaking, going to NSA. Now, when I got discovered, remember, I had already built speeches I was delivering. You're not going to get discovered if opportunity knocks unless you have a good speech. I had invested and I was one of the first people at the National Speaker Association said, I work with speech coaches. And this was after I was a Hall of Fame key keynote speaker. So I have... I have, and I enjoy this, you understand. You have to love learning if you're going to increase. I took screenwriting classes, comedy writing classes. Uh, I even hired a choreographer and said, do you know anything about speaking? And he said, no. I said, good, I want to pay you to watch me deliver a three-hour program. And from your point of view, tell me how I could improve. And he gave me one co comment that was masterful. He said, Patricia, you do a great job using the width of the stage. You don't do enough with the depth of the stage. And that was a great lesson. And because I use speech coaches, when people said to me, oh, can you help me with your speech? Can I hire you to help me with my speech? I said, well, I'll go to Ron Arden or Dawn Bernhardt, the people I've worked with. And then there were two conversations that transformed my life. One Saturday, I was speaking at a personnel company in Walnut Creek, about 35 miles from where I live. And I delivered my speech, the president of the company delivered her speech, and we were sitting having lunch and she said, do you do any speech coaching? I said, oh, a little for some of my friends. And she said, I wish I was one of your friends. I went home and I picked up a voicemail and this dynamic, incredible, fun sounding woman said, I don't know if you do this. However, if you do, I would love to hire you and give you to my husband for his birthday. What a great opening line. And she said, seven of my salespeople came to your speaking class and came back raving. And I don't know if you're an executive speech coach. However, if you are, I want to hire you to help my husband, who's a good speaker, but he has the most important speech of his career. And I thought, OK, universe, twice in an hour and a half. And that was the day I put my shingle up as an executive speech coach. Lesson there, if people want to give you money, you take it. That's a tweetable quote. Second, I was speaking at a sales meeting, as I often did. And the national sales manager came up to me and said, Patricia, I liked your speech. However, I loved how you delivered it. Can you teach our salespeople to speak that way? 
Because it takes us a year to be in a position to deliver an hour sales presentation to a hospital board. It's worth $9 million a year if we get the business and we are losing sales. It has nothing to do with our offering or our price. The presentation skills of our competitors are better than ours. That, that request, when I put together that program, little did I know, she had just given me this, the secret of always being in demand, even when perhaps I don't look quite as good on iMag and I'm not necessarily a hot new speaker. So that is a snapshot of a very long life and a 43 year speaking career. Actually, even longer than that, because I've been a member of the well, I've been a member of the National Speakers Association for 43 years. So now back to you. Let's have you ask me the questions, Anita, that everyone posed. Thank you, Patricia. This is impressive. Patricia, your life story has answered our first few questions. This is getting very exciting now, and I can't wait to ask you for the next question. So here it is. How do you make those initial contacts to be able to speak at different events? What you do is you create a presence. If you want to attract corporate clients, one, you need to have an offering that would work for them. In other words, do you help this company increase productivity, increase sales, increase market share? You have to have a subject that is of interest to a corporate market. It's probably easier to get an association market first because associations are made up of smaller business people, smaller, medium size. You always have big sizes. And there's always, when you speak, you speak a lot. You need to have an audience. And then if you do a good job, people come up and say, what would you charge to say that to my group? Or we need you to say that to your group. If you are going to make a living as a speaker, consultant, coach, trainer, your marketing needs to be as good as you're speaking. Okay, thank you, Patricia. So the next question is, are free presentations a good idea to get paid speeches? Well, how much am I getting for this presentation? And this is my philosophy. It is better to do something for nothing than nothing for nothing. So, for example, one of my friends who was speaking for a National Speakers Association group said her program was designed around how she went from a, a, a speaker to running a small training company with multiple presenters. And she said, when we came into 2000, we had more business booked that year than we'd ever had. It was going to be our best year ever. When March came around, pandemic, all business was gone. And I remembered in the early days of our National Speakers Association chapter, Patricia Fripp gave a presentation that said, any week you are not speaking for fee, you should be speaking for free. And so, yes, it's a matter of at the beginning of your career, you are probably going to give free presentations. However, even at this stage of my career, it, there are showcase opportunities. And certainly last year when clients came to me and said, oh, Patricia, uh, can you help do a, a web training for our distributors? 
And I, I often would have said, is there a budget or are you asking me for a favor? And either way, I would say yes, because there are a lot of people who, when they have money and business was good, they paid me. And I know there's a matter of relationship capital that certainly you're going to develop. So, yes, I do believe free presentations, especially with the right audience, is part of your marketing. Now, let me throw other one piece of advice that worked very well early in my career, and it will work very well for you. Once you are beginning to build a demand and people are paying you, people are going to still ask you, could you speak for free? Now, at the beginning, you want to speak to everybody you possibly can that is going to help you. And so what you might say is, well, do you, how el what else could you give me? If you, I understand you don't have a budget, what else can you give me? So, for example, one day I'm in my office and a woman called and said, is this Patricia Fripp? Yes. I hear you are the best speaker in the entire world. Obviously, she was sucking me up. up to me. And I said, you heard right. And she said, I am the program chair for women in travel. And we have the installation of officers in two weeks. So just as she was talking, I flicked over my calendar and I was going to be in town. She said, we would like you to speak. And this is what I said to her. I don't need the practice and I'm not going to do it for nothing. However, I will take soft dollars. Now, soft dollars means you will take a trade. So I said, you go away and find out what you could do, what would be the best offer, the best benefit you could give me, and then come back and either say yes or no. The next thing she came back and said, would you be willing to take a free first class airline ticket to England? I use frequent flyer miles most of the time when I go to England and I cash them in for business class tickets or at least at the time rather than first class. It would that was worth dollar wise was worth more than my fee. So what else can you give me? Write that down. What else can you give me? Then there's another point of view, and that is. I don't believe there is a free speech. There might be no money. However, every time, especially in this world, you get more comfortable with technology and virtual meetings. You get to practice new material. You develop a relationship with people you didn't know before. You are getting your stories and your repertoire more internalized and you can find out what works, what doesn't work. There are many benefits. Now, you might say, well, Patricia, you're not getting paid for this. You're not getting paid to speak at the spring conference. And let me and I'd like to know in the chat. If you're familiar with my brother, Robert Fripp, he has a band called King Crimson. And in the year before last, they had the King Crimson 50th anniversary tour. He had a press conference and the editor of Rolling Stones flew over to London and asked him this question. Mr. Fripp, what is the purpose of the 50th anniversary tour of King Crimson? And my brother, who is definitely the brilliant mind in the family, said, to introduce King Crimson to innocent ears. Now, take that simple idea 
and look at us if you want to build your speaking reputation. Every time you speak for an audience who's not familiar with you, and I know in our audience, there are people who have heard me, they've seen me on email, they've heard Darren LaCroix, Ed Tater, Craig Valentine or Mark Brown talk about me, they might have seen me. Uh, you know, they might have been in Las Vegas in 2015. However, not only have a lot of people never heard of me, let alone never spoken, I am introducing my ideas, methodology, and just my backstory to innocent ears. Why you can, or how you can introduce yourself into innocent ears in this world is, do you have a YouTube channel? That's free. See, what is different now than when I began and we would spend, you know, eight, ten, twenty thousand dollars for a demo video. Now everything is a demo video. And I would suggest for those of you who've had a, a YouTube channel for a long time, go back and delete some of the earlier ones. You know, you're so much better now. You don't have to have your old videos. So with that, have I answered the question, <laughs> do I believe in free speeches? Yes, because they're really not free. Absolutely. This was brilliant, Patricia, which brings me um, to the next question. How does one go about finding their message? Very much as I did, Anita. Many people said to me, can you help me write four speeches? And I say, no, let's write one that people want to hear. Other people, I want to be a motivational speaker. Now, my idea is Les Brown and Willie Jolly, there are some people who are the, they're fabulous motivational speakers. My point of view is that motivation is how you deliver your message. It might interest you to know, when I was speaking at Microsoft, this was a big conference for them. I followed the chief compliance officer. Now, I know I've helped a lot of compliance officers and they say to me, this is a boring subject. There are no boring subjects. There are only boring speakers. He was electrifying. He was one of the best opening acts for my presentation ever. Motivation is how you deliver your message. You can only speak about what you know. Now, perhaps you're speaking about what you're passionate about. It might be your hobby. In fact, one of my hairstyling clients, Pete Butler, was in the financial services world. And when he saw that I was speaking to build my business, I gave him some advice and I would recommend him the groups I spoke for. And Pete Butler was one of the most popular free speakers at service clubs in San Francisco. And when he was 50, he trained for a triathlon. And his speech was around this format. Planning for your financial future is very much like running or training for a triathlon. And then he regaled his audience for the next 23 minutes on different athletic ev events that he'd been part of. And they were fun and they were riveting. And then he said, in the last four minutes, here are four questions you need to ask your financial advisor if you're planning for a successful retirement or an affluent future. When he finished speaking, and I watched him many times, including groups I was part of, people would line up to get his business card and ask him questions. You see, he was talking about what he knew 
from the point of view of his hobby and this was the best sales presentation he could give because he engaged and interested his audience. So it can be what you know. I always say to speakers, you get paid for what you know. You get paid well for delivering it well. If you happen to be a best-selling author, if you happen to be in the news for any reason, because some of best, you've all seen best-selling authors who are necessarily not great speakers. However, it's who they are that got them the big bucks. So how do you find what you talk about? What do you know or what you're passionate about? It's the same with if you're going to write a book. You are going to live with this subject for a long time. Make sure it's one that engages you. Thank you, Patricia. This is outstanding. Next question will be, does a motivational speaker need to be a subject matter expert? Yes. Revert to the last answer. What are you passionate about or what do you know? Okay. This one, interesting. How do you convince people you are the right speaker they need? How do we do that? You do that by your marketing and your visibility. And these days, a lot of your social media, because the first question I have when people call or send me an email is, were you recommended or am I the end of a search? And as many years as I've been in, in business and as many customers and clients as I have, the amount of conferences I've spoken at, the, it is incredible how often I hear the end of a search. That means you have to have a good website with good video samples on and testimonials. Your marketing has to answer the questions, what do you do? Who do you do it for? And what do they say about what you do? And if you're going to speak, some samples of you. Because usually by the time anyone would contact you, they've already done their research. That's why. Were you recommended or have you done a search? And so it's by the time you have a conversation. And one question I often say is if I'm talking to someone and this is now, of course, most of my my inquiries now are for coaching leadership teams or sales teams or executives or celebrity speakers. So a lot of the time what I am doing, I am not looking so much for for speeches. Now, I am speaking a lot at virtual sales meetings. What you ha I often ask is which which other of my friends are you considering? And if I hear, it's a relatively small world, so I often hear it with this, and I say, well, the good news is you can't make, you can't make a bad decision. We're all, we'll all do a good job for you. How you convince them is really the quality of your questions. Now, in the early days, when people would ask us, and this is going back, this is not now, but you go back 35 years, people would say, oh, we want a motivational speaker. Well, if I talk to them, I say, well, what do you want to motivate your people to do? Where are they now? It's the quality of your questions. So when you have a conversation and you cannot negotiate an email, the amount of times people say, well, what do you, would you charge to do this? I have no idea. What I can promise you, we have an offering for most budgets. Our first logical step is to have a conversation. You, you, you need to know because in the conversation, very often you, very often you are going to show more interest in them or you already know more about them 
it, this is about relationships. So it's marketing relationships and relationships come from conversations. Now, I'll give you one easy, specific example. Because we're in the room, the world of virtual meetings, just as this backdrop is our logo for the conference. When I have a when I have an inquiry, I'll say, well, the first logical step is, is let's have a conversation. Here is a link to get on my calendar and we're going to have a Zoom meeting. It's so much easier to build rapport when you can see people. I will brand my backdrop to their company before I do any work with them. I'm not saying it get, gets me the business, but it gives me an edge because there's only one... There's only one thing I ever wanted in business, Anita, and that was an unfair advantage. And an unfair advantage is not light, lying, cheating or stealing. It's looking at what is possible, looking at what other people do and do your very best to notch it up. And branding your background for your prospects is one way. Outstanding, Patricia. So our next question, what is a speaker's greatest asset? Well, the speaker's greatest asset is they have to have a grasp of what it takes to be a good speaker. So why don't we look at a virtual FRIP? Let's look at some of the basics that contribute to a good presentation. Whether it's an important conversation or a formal or informal presentation, you need to have scintillating content, strong speech structure, start on a high and close with impact, scripting that is specific, memorable stories and examples, emotional and intellectual connection. In my role as your personal coach, I will encourage you to have the discipline to build rehearsal into your daily life. Our goal as a speaker is always to speak, to be remembered and repeated. We want you to understand how to speak for impact and results. So how about that? You won, you do have to understand and you have to be a good speaker. And this is not only giving a good speech, because some of my coaching clients are Hall of Fame keynote speakers. I mean, some speakers have come to me charged $25,000 a speech before we work together. And they are good, but it's amazing how many people have great speeches, but they never really learned how to structure a presentation, which is very important. Now, there is obviously a structure there. And a lot of time when I work with people as a group or as presentations such as I will be giving for you or, or an individual, it's let's look at what you have and take it apart again because there are a couple of ways to improve. One is knowing what you are doing that works. However, what is the technique behind it? Because a lot of speakers know what they're doing is good, but they don't know why. Because once you know why, you can teach it to others. You become a better evaluator, for example. And then two, discovering what needs to be improved. I say to my clients, you are not going to improve what you're not aware of. Now, understand my job is to help you better understand what you need to know. Because the reason executives have coaches is because their direct reports can't tell them the truth because their jobs depend on having a good relationship. And I I encourage my my fairly senior level people to say, if you want to improve this, just tell your family and tell the people you work with closely, I am working on this. If you hear me say it, please, you will help me. If you say, Mr. Executive, Ms. Manager, what do you mean by this? Or whatever it is that they're working on. 
Fabulous. Next question for you, Patricia. What is the best advice on taking my expertise into the corporate market? Well, that is your marketing, that is your contacts, that is your conversation. And if you go back to my hairstyling days, it's who do you know who can introduce you? Who do you know in the corporate market? And I'll give you one, a couple of specific examples. As I got busy, I couldn't do free speeches. And I had a young, you might call him a mentee, a good friend in the National Speakers Association chapter in Northern California, who was, he was working in a technology company as a sales manager, but he was, he was developing speeches. And what I would say is, well, I would love to help you. However, I, I'm just too busy. I can't commit a date three weeks out that I'm probably going to sell. Let me recommend you to my friend, Tom. He's a great speaker. However, it's earlier in his career. And Tom often came back and said, well, thank you for that introduction. I made $10,000 out of that. And I said, look, if I'd known they're going to be $10,000 for you, I wouldn't have recommended you. I would have taken it myself. But this is what he did. And this is how you take advantage of opportunities. One, he would say, I would certainly happy to do your presentation for you. However, what I'd like you to do is, could you get me a 30 minute meeting in with your head of training? Or in other words, he got payment. You see, it wasn't a free speech. He got payment. He got an appointment in someone in the organization or in the company or in the group that had influence to book. And, and out of that, he got work. Another example, someone who used to come to Darren and my coaching camps and Lady and the Champs a lot. Chris, she was a financial advisor. And I said, one of my best clients, this is the 25th consecutive year I'll be working with them on multiple projects for their conventions. Pay, American Payroll Association, I said, payroll and finance, there's a connection. Call your local chapter, because there are about 127 local chapters now, of course, they would be all online, so it doesn't even have to be in your own city or state. And say, Patricia Fripp, they would probably know me, uh, said, you might like to be, you might be interested in hearing this preach. And I understand you don't have a budget. All I ask is, if you like my speech, will you recommend me to your state conference? See, you're getting something out of it. If this is good as we both expect it and hope it will be, will you do this for me? The law of reciprocation. And she did a good job. And they recommended her to the state conference where she got paid. Now, once in a while, Anita, you just luck out. I mean, I lucked out any way you look at it at that first National Speakers Association convention, sitting next to the person who said, would you like to speak on this program for new speakers? If I hadn't sat in the chair, I wouldn't have had the opportunity. At that state conference, it was a celebration of 20 years of a chapter and their executive director, Dan Maddox, was there and he said, Chris, we don't normally book financial planners and advisors at our conventions. However, you were obviously so well-intentioned, your speech was good, and he booked her at a higher fee than the state conference to speak at a breakout session at his convention. Think big, start small. The corporate market, who do you have that works in the corporate market? However, it's like, how do I get a speaker's bureau to book me? You don't make the call until you're ready to exceed their expectations. 
think big. This is amazing. Think and this, big, start small. I love that. And Patricia, this will bring us to our last question about building a speaking career. So the last question is, what are the most important the most essential elements to include in a successful professional speaker promo video. Good. As everyone heard it earlier, this has changed over the years. I consider every, every clip. I take a lot of my speeches and you can easily go to Patricia Fripp YouTube channel. There are over 500 videos. And what we do, we take, we take whole speeches and cut them into segments. And I would consider everything a demo video. Uh, many of the speakers now, they would include some of their backstory of how they develop their expertise. Bottom line, very much like your marketing. What do you do? Who do you do it for? What do they think? and show them in the best light. And whereas the American Payroll Association, my best client, I was one of the first people in the speaking industry, the first that I know of, that had a demo VHS. It was, it was produced by one of my friends who was a TV producer, and it was fabulous. And what we had was 18 minutes of high action clips. And then we put a whole speech on the end, because if you really were engaged, and Dan Maddox, the executive director of the American Payroll Association, had never seen a demo VHS before. He watched the entire promo and the entire program, the whole speech. It was about an hour and 20 minutes. And he booked me in 1987. That was the first time. Now, you remember what I said? It's relationships and offering more and developing. This is now from 1996 to this year, every single year. I, I coach his, his senior people. I write the speeches. I moderate man and woman of the year. I've delivered keynotes and breakout sessions. I, I deliver speaking schools for all the other speakers. Which brings up to another question. And Dan Maddox, when he has spoken to speakers, he says, it is not my job to know how else I can use you. It's your job to tell me. So, for example, we all most likely, if you've been in the speaking business, you have more than one speech or you can do a keynote and a breakout session. You can do coaching. There's a lot of what you can do. It's our job to let the world know and that you might include in your demo video. Thank you, Patricia. Now we are going to look at the audience's question about presentation skills. And your yes. first question is, what process do you use to organize and write your speeches? Let's look at if I were going to at the spring conference, which I am not going to talk about this, is what is the best way to put together your presentation. The creative process is messy. Your presentation needs to be tidy. So this is the process that you go through with a whiteboard, a flip chart, a yellow pad, you put what might go in your presentation. What are the talking points? What are the goals? What, what stories are you going to use? What are your key ideas? What are you going to ask them to do as a result of listening to you? This is all important. This is messy. And then this is how this is streamlined. You gather your content. You might collaborate. So, for example, if you're part of a mastermind or if this presentation is for your company, you might be speaking on behalf of the training department of the marketing team or the technology team. You're going to collaborate. You have to then put together a, your structure, which I will show you next. 
then create some opening scripting build your chunks of content add your stories and examples you're usually going to have a q a and a challenge and a close and then you're going to rehearse now that is the process now i am frequently asked do you write out your speech if you were going to write a seven minute speech i would say talk it out loud and write down what you say however if you have an hour presentation i would Unless that really works for you and you know how to write conversationally, I would not recommend you do it. This is what I would recommend. You need to understand the speech structure. The first 30 seconds and the last 30 seconds have the most impact. That doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to open. You know, I have a whole series of openings. And I also have a series of techniques and opening lines, which which I teach. For mere mortals, you might not begin with your you might not begin with your opening. What you might do is start and this is you look at all your creativeness. What does the audience want or need? What is your premise, your premise, your big idea, your central theme? Now, if you look at the premise of our presentation, it is it might not be stated, but our premise of this conversation we're having is that you, Toastmaster, will be well served to attend our spring conference. That's your premise. That's your big idea. That's your central theme, whether you say it or not. Then what you do is your points of wisdom, your talking points is proving your premise. In other words, everyone can sell more. How do you do it? One, two, three, four. And our talking points are very much well, listen to what Patricia Fripp is saying about how, if you want, you could take these skills and become a professional speaker. This is how she puts together her presentation. And even if you have no goal to be a professional speaker, you are smart enough to know the higher up your corporate ladder you go, the more important your presentation skills become. And I know I have a lot of my clients come to me because they say my boss says I you know, I'm not going to get promoted if I don't improve my presentation skills so let's go back to you're going to open and there are different ways you can open however the purpose of the opening is to arouse interest in the subject you and you always have to focus your presentation on your audience and then your talking points, I call them points of wisdom, and you can expand them different ways. So, for example, what you might do is, is say, introduce an idea. Now, you might have to give an explanation of what you mean by this, then an example of what you mean by this, and then the application for the audience. Then a seamless transition. A seamless transition, if you're on stage, might be moving from one area to another on the stage. It might Remember I told you about the choreographer and he said using the depth of the stage while well, taking that idea. So that is a talking point. OK, that is is one point of wisdom might be the understand the stage and use the depth of the stage so that is an idea so the explanation might be patricia by using all the width of the stage that's good but there are times sometimes you can be more dramatic by using different pages parts of the stage that's an explanation an example is so very often when you deliver your opening now it might be a story and then you can take two steps 
forward to step into the body of the speech. Then, as you do your review, you can say, last story, and you take two steps forward closer. In, so you're stepping into your presentation, now you're step, stepping out of your presentation. That is a theatrical technique. You don't do it more than a few times in your presentation, maybe only two or three, or it looks like a technique. Because as Laurence Olivier say, the art is hiding the art. So let's go back. So that's one way you would put together a chunk of content. Now imagine certainly what you might do is this could be a speech at Toastmasters, could be one chunk of content and you might deliver the next chunk of con content the next time you speak and this might follow the formula past, present, future. Every January and February sales meeting that I speak at, the executive follows this formula. We are here to celebrate last year's success. Be introduced to this year's plans and strategy. And then this is what we could look forward to in the future. Based on that. You might also want to introduce it from the point of view of problem, solution, example. Now, our friends are wondering, do you include all three in your presentation? You might, or you might just pick one and do it for all. You're going to do a review, Q&A, and then close on a high. Now, if people stay till the end, I'll show you a way you can get not only opening lines, but also the speech diagram. Fabulous. Patricia, you are famous for your opening lines. Can you give us a few suggestions? Well, perhaps I could. Let's just see. Right. We always want to open with impact. Welcome to You Have Choices, Options of Openings, The Techniques. As you soon will come to discover, our subtitle is How to Open Your Presentation with Impact. At the beginning of a speech, presentation, seminar, client meeting, report to senior management, sales presentation, or any manner of presentation you deliver, you need to arouse interest in the subject. After all, we stand in the rain to see a movie. Would you stand in the rain to listen to your presentation? That is a nice provocative <laughs> way to introduce the subject. Let's look at what is a practical application for most of our Toastmasters. You are in, you have a job. You are probably, you probably find for every formal presentation you design and deliver in a company setting you have dozens of frequent unplanned meetings. And when you deliver superbly well, when you weren't even on the agenda, or even if you are on the agenda, you, it's, what, it's almost like a cameo appearance. That is when you get the reputation Oh, wow, what a great speaker. She didn't even know she was on the program. And I know this happens all the time because I hear from all my clients. Oh, Anita, I didn't know you were going to be here. Can you come up and give us an update on what the marketing department's doing? You have, in a, in a yesterday world and the hopefully six months from now world, you have from the eighth row up to the front of the room to do a report. Now in a Zoom meeting, you have a couple of seconds. 
And this is how you build your reputation. You have what I call you are perpetually prepared. And I would suggest to all of you, as I do to my clients, anytime you're going to a meeting, prepare what you might say, even if you're not on the agenda. Because it helps the discipline of being ready for when you are. And on those occasions when we say, well, we're, we're 10 minutes ahead of schedule. Anita, give us an update on the project you're working on. And this is where you have in your back pocket. In your back pocket, you have opening lines and you have a framework to which you slot in. Because now you only got three seconds. And these are my suggested back pocket opening lines for the for the real world that we are now living in. Thank you for the opportunity to update you on the latest project, whatever that is. On behalf of the dedicated six person marketing team, we are very proud that. Now put this report in the context. As you will remember, in January, our leadership challenged us too. In June, you heard this. And now our greatest success, our biggest challenge, and what we would like your help with is this. That is a framework. It will serve you well when you're put in the spot and it will serve you well when you have to organize a formal presentation. So that is the most practical advice I can give you for your job as it is now. If you're delivering a speech and I am going to in the presentation at the spring conference, we're going to in depth look at opening lines. Just a couple might be transport the audience. You can transport them to the future or the past. So if you were saying, I wish you could have been there, you were taking them back to a situation. If you're saying, imagine you walk on stage and receive a resounding ovation. Okay, you're taking them into the future. You might also start with an interesting statistic or little known fact. And if you are going to introduce an interesting statistic or little known fact, add an emotion to it. It might interest you to know. It might surprise you to know that. It might shock you to know that. Because any time the audience hears you, oh, oh, what? And you give them a second to engage before. So you can walk out and say 76% of your, well, Here's a statistic. 76% uh, of, of employees are not engaged. And, and when I have statistics like this, I say, one, people only care about their employees. So this is what I would recommend my clients and have recommended, they say. It might surprise you to know that 78% of your employees aren't engaged. Plus, for me, you got two you or yours. You is a magic word. Because I work on the principle, nobody cares about me nearly as much as they care about themselves. So that's it until the spring conference on openings. <laughs> Thank you, Patricia. I love that. Perpetually prepared. Be perpetually prepared. That's a great, great tip. Thank you for that. And now we are more curious how to open, how to craft a closing message. You taught us about opening message and we want to know more about the closing message. You And, and I'm going to recommend you go to the Patricia Fripp YouTube channel and you type in how to open and close a presentation. That is one of my most watched YouTube channels. But this is the secret. After you, so you've opened, you've introduced your premise, you've gone through your body, then you do a review. 
and your review is based on your premise. So let me give you a specific example. If we just look at, if we just look at this presentation, you might say, now that you better understand, if you want to get paid to speak, you have to develop a subject other people want to pay for and you have to deliver it well. And marketing is as important as the quality of your speech if this is how you make a living. With your demo video, everybody needs to know who you are, what you do, who you do it for and what they say. When it comes to del delivering a good presentation, remember the creative process is messy. Your presentation is tidy. Your first process is with a whiteboard flip chart or yellow pad, write every every aspect that might go in your presentation and then you focus on what is the big idea, the premise or the central theme. What are your talking points that prove your premise? And then add your stories and examples and you open and close. And you always do a review and then challenge the audience to take action. If you say you want to be a professional speaker, then start with who knows and loves you as Patricia did in her hairstyling salon with her customers. People who support you and what you are now doing will find you groups to speak to. However, you have to have something to say. There is no entity as a free speech. You are always getting experience and developing skills. And then you're going to close with your last words linger. You might close with a last story. Or it could certainly be remember. I hope you will remember Fripp. However, much more important than remembering me, remember what Fripp stands for. Frequently reinforce ideas that are productive and profitable. Thank you, Patricia. So our next question, how do you decide which feedback to consider? First, most unsolicited feedback is not valuable. Now, that doesn't mean it's not valuable. We are not talking about your Toastmaster Club where you have evaluators and they will tell you, rightly so, what you did well and what you need to improve. I am reminded of when I was first in demand, I was a professional speaker and I were Toastmasters District 4. They considered it was such a great honor to have me speak at their district conference, which I was happy to do, of course. And I was delivering a keynote and then there was a 15 minute break where I had the opportunity to sell my books and probably cassettes at the time, moving fast. And then I was delivering two breakout sessions. Now that is a lot of work in one day to keep your energy going, etc. And at this 15 minute break, a Toastmaster came up to me and said, can I give you some constructive criticism? Now you understand I'm taking money at the time and autographing books, not the most appropriate time. And then I said, no, and I'm still signing books and taking money. And he said, uh, please, I said, no. And he said, why not? Now, let's freeze frame for one moment. First of all, I was the past president of the National Speakers Association, a Hall of Fame keynote speaker. And I am not saying a Toastmaster couldn't give me feedback. However, anyone who is such an idiot to select such a terrible time to do it and phrase it that way 
wants to feel superior or good themselves rather than supporting me. Take that into consideration. And I said to him, because you will irritate me so much, I am going to take it out on the next two audiences. Because this, I was already getting upset with him. How we feel makes such a difference in how we deliver for our audiences. For example, I learned very early in life, before you're given a speech, don't call your office and hear the problems that they want to delegate to you rather than solving. That, so when you are looking for feedback, one, does the person giving you feedback have good enough experience? Now you can say they can always give you their opinion, which is valid. Now I felt this. Third, do they have your best, your best? Do they have you in mind? You're, is their advice given with good intentions? They're supportive of you. Because when my friends, many of them who charge three times as much for a keynote as I do, say, Patricia, would you please, and they're serious, give me feedback on the presentation? I'd say, certainly. And after the presentation, I, whether it's virtual or whether it's in person, same advice. That was fabulous. You could tell the audience loved you. I did take a few notes and if you'd like to hear them, let's make a Zoom call next Friday. Because you have to let a speaker enjoy their speaker high. Now, if it's obvious and I've been in these situations where I did not do well and my my supporters knew I did not do well. You don't want it rubbed in at the point. A week from now, let's look at how we could have made that better. Or, see, there's only one mistake in life, according to the famous Robert Fripp. And by the way, I'd be interested to know in the chat if, if we have any King Crimson or Robert Fripp fans. There's only one mistake in life. Lot not learning from your mistakes. And I often ask my audiences, have you ever bombed? And of course, there are three types of speakers. Those who have bombed, those who will bomb, and those who will bomb again. It doesn't matter how successful we are, there are some situations, many beyond our control, that don't work as well as others. We just learn from it and move on. Thank you, Patricia. And uh, Patricia, we only have 15 minutes left and we do have uh, six questions left. So in and... other words, speed up and give us your <laughs> answers, Rick. And also just to let you know that in the chat, we do have uh, the audience who have mentioned that they are Kim Crimson and or Robert free fans good and the next question that's a burning one how do you improve your speech for international contest have it transcribed and hire a world champion not me to help you uh, ed tate and mark brown are world champions who are a good friend of mine and that's who i recommend everyone to this is not this is not advice that I give. However, what I will say with any short presentation, every word counts and multiple, 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 multiple rehearsals. Again, this is when, and I know a lot of the world champions go to every Toastmaster club to practice it. Some advice they get is better than others. So if you are really serious, you might want to hire a world champion like Mark Brown and Ed Tate who do this. Patricia Fripp does not. What Patricia Fripp would say, the chances of winning the world championship are minuscule. I would challenge you to take the same amount of effort 
to work on your presentation skills, either one, to have a speech that you could sell, or two, to get you promoted in your company. Thank you. So the next question, what advice do you have for those with English as a second language? We all have an accent to somebody. And Anita, you have an accent that is different to mine. The secret is you have to be understandable. Our accents are part of what makes us unique and interesting and an object of interest. However, you and, and I have many working in Silicon Valley, many of my clients are from India or Asia. And they are great speakers. Many of them, I say, slow down. And if this is your situation, you might want to work with someone who can help you. There are many experts who can. I am not one of them. This is a simple exercise. Read out loud and enunciate every word from the newspaper or a book five minutes in the morning and five minutes in the afternoon, record yourself and listen. Brilliant. Next question. How can we be memorable to the audience? Everything that we have already heard. Okay. Is it better to stand up or sit down when speaking? Well, it depends. If you're in a virtual meeting, you might want to sit down. However, if you're on stage, you're going to stand up. Next question. Okay. And how to improve your enunciation and quality of voice? I believe you just talked about that. That would be very much the same. And a lot of this has to do with breath and, uh, you know, breathe and this is also how you you get over nervousness, which is another question. Breathe and channel your nervousness into excitement. Many, many people have come to me because they said, my boss says I talk too quietly. I said, your boss is right. Get to the other side of the room and shout at me. And they say, now you are sounding normal. This is, this is when you have to breathe, learn breath control and practice. Thank you. When presenting virtually, what do professional speakers need to do to adjust? You need to understand the technology. My studio here looks a little bit like Houston. We, we're ready for launch off. You don't have to have a green screen with backgrounds, although it's probably helpful. You do have to have a tidy background. You do need to understand the technology, which is another reason why you would practice and you would take free situations. But at the very less, get comfortable. You need to look in the camera and create an energetic intimacy because your audience, there might be hundreds of people. You have to get used to talking who you think is nobody. Thank Practice. You. Practice, yeah. How can you get rid of nerves? <laughs> Breathe, excitement, and as Michael Caine says, rehearsal is the work, performance is the relaxation. I was apprehensive this morning. I wouldn't call it nerves, but you never know, you know, when I was getting ready. This is part of the process. However, if we want to be, if we want to be speakers, if we just want to advance in whatever our career is, we got to get over it. So consider it. Oh, oh, I'm excited. And stop telling yourself what you don't want. People, you know, I have executives come to me, oh, I'm a terrible speaker. I say, well, the first lesson is stop telling you yourself that. Tell yourself, I'm a great speaker in process. You are an untrained speaker. You're not a bad speaker. You're an untrained speaker. You have to focus on learning to be a good speaker if you're going to be a good one. 
And our last question will be, Patricia, how can our audience get more information from you? Very simply, if you go to my website, which believe it or not is fripp.com, if you look up at the top right, it says sign up for free resources and you will have wonderful special reports and, and just amazing information. My YouTube channel is we have a put the Patricia Fripp channel. We have over 500 videos and we're adding them all the time. And if you really want to take all my presentation secrets and we were teasing earlier, of course, what I say to all my world champion friends, I've taught you all everything, you know, I haven't taught you everything. I know a proven system and repeatable process, of course, is my Fripp virtual training. And for any, any of our audience if you were interested in this, you would use FRIP as a coupon code for my, my gift to you, which of course would be a 20% discount. So that's it. We have plenty for fee. And if you're really serious, then everything I know of 43 years of travel, the best of it is in FRIP virtual training. Wow. Patricia, I wish we could have spent more time with you this afternoon. You are a true gift to the people in your life. You are such an inspiration. And we have learned so much from you today. We can't wait to hear your keynote speech at our virtual spring conference. If you like this, the speech is much better. Thank you, Patricia. Over to you, Chris. Thank you, Anita. I don't know about you, but that was pretty amazing, wasn't it? I've learned a great deal, and I feel confident that all of the members of our audience have as well. Patricia, thank you so much for sharing with us. And if you've enjoyed or learned from today's event, your comments are welcome in the chat. I know Patricia would love to see them. We would as well. So please share those either directly or within the chat. I know we've had a few last minute questions. Unfortunately, it's not realistic to try and cram those in along with the ones that came in at registration. I do, however, think that we should double what we're paying you, Patricia. Maybe we can talk about that, Wendy. I'll look at my budget for sure. <laughs> Thank yes. you so much. So now go and plan your attendance at District 60's annual conference this April. You'll hear more from Patricia. There will also be workshops and other events. Conference registration opens tomorrow, February 1st at Toastmasters60.com. I know Bruce Lang is still <laughs> hoping to be the first to register, but keep an eye on the event calendar for the links to reserve your space. I promise, even if you're not first, we'll still have room for you. We're going to put a link as well to the event calendar in chat. If you don't have it handy, it's a great thing to bookmark on whatever browser you prefer. There is so much at the conference, outstanding speakers, exceptional workshops, and networking opportunities. You can even attend from your sofa, in your pajamas, with your favorite <laughs> beverage. Maybe don't tell us what that is. Will you be joining us? Thank yes. you for being here today. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Chris and Anita. You've done a fabulous job as always. We'll see Thank you at the you. conference. You will. <laughs>